do a panel discussion today about the work that the mental health and wellness task force has done. But I wanted to just give you a little bit of background before we get into the panel discussion. So I, when it was February, I think, there, there was a similar panel like this for Women's Month, maybe March. 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 And um, a conversation came up about the need for potential behavioral, mental health, psychosocial support services here at Women's Pond. Uh, there was a, a rather impromptu and lengthy discussion about it here at, the, at that meeting, uh, which then came, resulted in a conversation at the Residence Council uh, about what we might do. And there was some discussion back and forth about what our options are and what we might be able to do. Uh, and ultimately what we decided to do was to generate a survey. Um, some of you remember we did a mental health survey probably in April. April. And the results of that survey were received by me and then I thought it would be a good idea for us to put together a task force to see what we could do with the results. So we put into Chanticleer an open call for folks that wanted to participate in this task force. And so these are the members of the task force. And actually, this was not on our agenda, but it might be good for you all just to introduce yourselves um, and a little bit about your background. So these are the members of the task force, plus me and Cameron are sort of, and Sarah. But why don't you introduce yourself and tell a little bit about your background and why you were interested. Uh, Wayne Lavender, I've been here six months, but before that I uh, had an office where I did psychotherapy for 48 years. Um, I got my doctorate at Adelphi in Long Island, I did my postdoc work at NYU, and then I taught uh, supervised residents, psychiatric residents and psychologists in psychotherapy at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine for 27 years. So, uh, I retired in December, came here at the end of December, um, and um, I'm glad to be on the panel with all these ladies. Um, and uh, that's a, a lot of you know me already. This is better. Well, I don't have to repeat that. Yeah. I'm Tamar Osler. Uh, I've been in private practice, not 48 years, 45 years of <laughs> private practice. Uh, and I'm still seeing patients on Zoom and on FaceTime, but I'm not, I had been going into the city and I haven't done that for two and a half years. Um, I received an MSW from NYU and I completed psychoanalytic training of eight years with the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis, way back in the 70s and 80s. Um, the field has changed a great deal since then. I'm here three and a half years. My husband and I had a house four minutes drive from Woodland Pond. So we saw the whole saga of Woodland Pond beginning and the drama of whether or not it would get built. And when we decided to sell our house, Woodland Pond was just four minutes away. So here we are. Um, and I'm delighted to be on this project with everybody else. I'll pass the mic. Oh, thank you. Is one right here talking to it this way? Directly. Hi, I'm Rhea Stein. Uh, I've been here for, I think it's about eight years, although I keep losing an exact count. Um, I have a, an MS in mental health counseling from uh, City University of New York. Uh, I have worked in mental health programs for, well, about 25 years. Uh, I've worked for a mental health society. i worked with, uh, I worked with uh, child welfare for a long time, supervising uh, a borough office for the city of New York. I've had a private practice 
I've worked with domestic violence. I've worked with alcoholics. Um, I have a, a wide range of people that I have worked with. And uh, ever since I have been in Woodland Pond, as some of you may know, I have been an advocate for mental health services uh, for this population. And uh, I'm just absolutely delighted that we finally got to the point that we are and we will tell you more about what we've been working on as we go along with this panel. Good afternoon, Pat Howe. I know most of you with the hat that I wear as chair of the Interfaith Committee, and it is one of the reasons I'm on this committee is one of the questions that was brought to the Interfaith Committee was how can we have some good support here? and it went to the resident council and it went to Michelle and of course we've had Sarah who's on absence right now help us through this and um, my professional background is in education elementary secondary college teaching and um, I'm just delighted to be able to share information with most of you familiar faces, glad you're here. Hi everyone, I'm Ronnie Sue Jaffe. Um, Jeffrey and I moved here a little over a year ago. Um, my background is in social work. I got my MSW in 1979 in the city from Hunter College. And uh, all of my professional life was as a clinician and administrator of employee assistance programs. First with Mount Sinai Medical Center in New York, then St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital Center in New York, and my last job was as the director of the EAP for the New York City Transit Authority. And um, most, not all, but most of my clinical work has been with uh, substance abusers, but not completely. Um, but most of my work has been clinically and supervising people uh, doing short-term treatment and referral. And uh, Jeffrey and I um, signed up in 2019 to come to Woodland Pond. And while we were waiting for a cottage to be available, we had a, an apartment in the Central Wing. And then COVID hit and we we weren't here anymore. And I thought about all of you who were here and were isolated um, during COVID and it must have been you know, really difficult because I know how difficult it was for us. Uh, I'm talking of, you know, psychologically, emotionally, whatever. Um, so when this group formed, I was really thrilled that it did and I'm just very excited about working on this project. Thank you. Um, so this is Kathy Ryback. Uh, we're gonna introduce Kathy a bit more in just a minute, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some more of the initiatives of the task force. So we started meeting as a task force, I believe in May, April or May. Um, and we've been meeting every other Friday at 10 a.m. You'll see us in the conference room. And what we first determined was that as a result of the surveys that we did, there were really four low-hanging fruit type opportunities. So four immediate priorities were identified. And we're going to talk about, as a task force, how we are planning to address those four items today. So as we go through today, we'd like to take questions as we go. So if you have questions or comments, just go ahead and raise your hand. And Cameron, maybe you can bring the mic to them if they have a question. Um, and then we'll go from there. So the first priority that we identified was that we need to do a better job or be more proactive on a consistent basis with having someone from resident services, which is Sarah, Mary Jo, Angel, uh, Cameron's filling in now, but someone from resident services have a personal visit to you after we have learned that you have had some sort of a impactful event that has happened in your life. Um, and so what we talked about was things like uh, a hospital visit, a new diagnosis, 
the, a hospital visit, a new diagnosis of something, um, a loss of some sort that you've had. Uh, of course, this relies on us being aware of it, and we're not always aware of it, but we need to automatically, when we have news of that, not just talk about it amongst ourselves, because we do that anyway, but to check in with you, right? And, and really just start there. So it's, it's an identification of a potential issue, acknowledging that all of these things can have an impact on you, and, and really going from there. So that's, that's one of the first priorities that we identified, and that is a now management responsibility, okay? Um, I'm gonna rely on the members of the task force here to talk a little bit more about some of the other initiatives. Um, Rhea is gonna talk about uh, support groups, which was another priority identified as a result of the survey, and how we hope to uh, implement or enact the support groups here at the community. Rhea, would you like to discuss that? Uh, you can well, well uh, make sure you use that mic. This mic is working? This yeah. mic is working. Oh, I'll turn it over to Rhea. Sure. <laughs> is it working? Yes. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, we recognize the fact that uh, the survey seemed to point to uh, the desirability of having more support groups. Uh, that we identified a number of subjects that we know impact people throughout their life. One of them has to do with loss, and I don't mean just loss of a spouse, but it could be loss of anything, loss of your home, it could be loss of a pet. Uh, any kind of loss that affects you emotionally and affects the way you function. So we are looking to start a support group on the basis of loss. Um, you'll hear more about this as we go along. Uh, we're also looking to do one on uh, grief, which would be specifically for the loss of a human being. I mean, it doesn't have to be a, a spouse, it could be a mother, it could be a child, uh, but there are many issues as you get older that cause grief and very few opportunities to be able to talk openly about, about these subjects. And uh, we are also looking for uh, the idea of transition. Uh, it's been recognized that coming to Woodland Pond is a huge transition in all of our lives. We're leaving a certain way of life that we have lived for most of our life for many, many years, and we are coming to a different, a different not only lifestyle, but a kind of recognition of the fact that for many of us, this will be the last stop on the train. And we need to, to be able to talk about that more because that creates a tremendous amount of anxiety for people and may in fact cause depression that we're not aware of. Um, people can be depressed and you don't know they're depressed because they function. Not everybody falls apart and has to be hospitalized. People walk around not functioning but being depressed. And we want to be able to look at that. Some of the subjects we're talking about now will evolve because this is a evolving task force. Uh, it's not a one-shot deal. It's something that we hope will continue as we develop more programs to address mental health. Mental health is as important, or maybe more important than physical health because it affects your physical health. And if you don't have physical health, you can't function. So we, I'm just thrilled that we've come to the point where we have the resources to be able to look at these problems and address them. And I, it's just great that administration is working with us and we are a great team. A great team indeed. A great team indeed. Uh, I would just like to add, we are also thinking about doing the caregiver support. Oh, I let that one yes. out. Uh, caregiver support. There are two, types of caregivers that we're aware of. The people who have relatives in the a health center who do caregiving by going over there and feeding them and spending time with them. And the people who are doing it out of their home, uh, whose spouse 
is with them and they need a tremendous amount of support. So we're looking to start support groups for both categories of people and paying more attention to the needs of those people. I mean, we've had groups like this before, but we really haven't, we really haven't put a lot of meat onto the bones. So that's what this is about, to try to really flush out what some of the basic issue or, issues are and dealing with them. One of the things that we identified was very important, and this was as a result of the survey, was that the support groups that we put together be comprised strictly of Woodland Pond residents. Uh, we've done support groups in the past that were successful but were open to the public, and residents expressed an interest in having resident-only support groups. Um, we are going to be looking to use an outside facilitator for the support groups as much as possible rather than a resident or a member of leadership, and that's part of where Kathy will come into play. Um, and the last was that if there's an opportunity for these to be covered by, uh, or paid for by Woodland Pond, or covered by insurance, so that there's no cost to the residents or the support groups, we also felt that that was critical. So Woodland Pond has agreed that if we cannot find adequate means to have this bill to insurance, that Woodland Pond will cover the cost of facilitating the support groups, um, you know, as as an extension of our commitment to uh, these programs. Who else would like to say something about the support groups? Larry. Okay, Larry, looks like you've got a question or a comment. Yeah, question. <coughs> question. Uh, I'm happy to hear you talking about transitions, uh, primarily as I understood what you said. So that would be from your uh, previous resident into Woodland Pond, but I would like to suggest that there are certainly potential uh, and real uh, transitions from independent living in Woodland Pond to another level of service at Woodland Pond, and I think that needs to be part of the total vision. There is a, there is, that has been worked on in the past by the Residents Council there is a, 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 whole, um, a whole document that was developed in terms of processes that uh, administration and the residents go through to get to that point or till that decision is made. I'm not saying that we shouldn't look at that, but it has been looked at before and it's very, very detailed. And I'm sure you can get a copy of it if you're interested yourself in dealing with it. We uh, specifically are looking at how hard it is to come here and what you're giving up by coming here and, and helping you with that. Uh, just to follow up to Larry, there is a detailed manual, which I read through, but it's not emotional. It's right. the size of the bed, where the chair would go, what you do with your laundry, it's all practical things. There's nothing emotional in that transition. Yes. The support groups that we have mentioned are the first ones that we're looking at and think most important, uh, one of grief and loss, or one of caregivers. Transitions is a very big topic and I think we're sort of considering, do we want to put together the people who come to independent living and the issues of the health center, or perhaps they each deserve their own group. So depending upon responses and need, it's conceivable that those two groups would be separate because they're both huge issues. But you are aware that the task of the Welcome Committee mentors is to guide the new residents in their transition, and that can take months. We have talked about that at our meetings with Michelle uh, about the fact that the Welcome Committee exists, and I think that Michelle and some of the administration people will be meeting with the Welcome Committee to fold them into what we're trying to do and trying to uh, identify or have them be better at identifying some of the people who 
who have issues that can then be dealt with. Uh, some of this is not, I mean, it's not written in stone. We just began to meet, I think, May 5th when I looked it up. So there are many issues that have to be evolved with and worked with. Uh, Halima, I, one thing that came up in our work was the welcoming committee tends to be, I think Michelle used the word transactional. How do you do this? Where is this? Where is the dining room? How do you use the library? Just like what you said about the health center, that it's very concrete. And the wel welcoming committee, my understanding is, is sort of helping you negotiate with Lumpan. Again, this would be focusing more on the emotional aspects. Yeah, I, I, would, yeah, I would concur with all of that. I think that's fair. And as Rhea said, um, you know, we've made a lot of progress with the task force in a short time, but we have a lot of details to work out. So our, our approach to this is we want to introduce the concepts to you in phases. So today is an introduction. I believe that we will likely end up doing another survey now that we've talked about some of our concrete steps to understand from your perspective if you might personally be interested in, let's say, one of the four or however many groups that we do, if so, which one? Uh, and then we'll ask other questions as we go about the other initiatives. So does that about cover this initiative? Okay, so the next initiative that we identified or priority uh, is the opportunity for on-campus education uh, and information sharing about topics related to mental health and wellness. And Pat Howe is going to speak a bit about that initiative. I come with experience. <laughs> Having gone through the transition of moving here, and I've been here for eight years. After being here, in transition and independent, I became a caregiver in my apartment for over a year and a half until my husband transitioned to the memory care unit. And then I became an observer and a distance caregiver, even though I could be there every morning and every afternoon. And then I went into the next phase of loss and grief. So I know the difficulties, but also the comforts and also the needs that we have. I'll give you a little bit about education, past, present, and future. In the past, Sarah has been our conduit to some mental health issues that we as individuals have, both in transition, moving here, moving someone to the health center, and there was a therapist available to us for the individuals in the health center and available to us here who no longer is with us. He didn't go. I mean, he didn't pass away, but he no longer is a person providing care here. That's the past. The present is assessing what we need and want now. From the survey and from input amongst you and us, we know that we want support groups, big and small, led by professionals, led within so we don't have to go somewhere for it. We know that we're looking because most of us come with some solid education background and we want to know more. We want to know more for ourselves and for one another. So we're talking about possible seminars, bringing in professionals in the field of mental health for different issues. Just as our panel has mentioned, there are so many different issues related to mental health, whether it's abuse, whether it's grief, whether it's making change because our body has changed and we no longer can be the person we would like to be. So seminars, but that's a pretty heavy thing to think of bringing in professionals. The good news that's there is for the future. 
we have the benefit fund who has, that has an element to it that's supportive of education. So we could possibly tap into that benefit fund to bring in a renowned <laughs> presenter who'd be willing to come up the Hudson because oftentimes they're coming from New York City, but to bring that presenter, maybe it's the author of a book that we're following and we know it's a very worthwhile book. So that's the past, we're in the present, but you're here to help us develop this future plan. And when I say develop that, maybe you have connections to the people who are the professionals that can help us with any of those groups that we talked about, whether it be for caregivers, be for grief, for whatever the mental health issue is. And the other thing is, give yourself credit because you're still here in spite of the fact you've gone through one of the major changes of our lifetime, and that's COVID. <coughs> We've made some good health decisions. We want to keep it going. Excellent uh, description, Pat. Does anyone have anything they'd like to add on the educational piece or questions or comments from the audience? So uh, the next priority that we identified um, was the need for Woodland Pond to reestablish a resource for providing referral for one-to-one -one support and one-to-one -one counseling. So as Pat had indicated, we previously had a relationship with a psychologist who would go door to door uh, and meet with folks, and, and that person is no longer uh, here at Woodland Pond. So the survey indicated that there's a portion of resident population here that would be interested in being able to see a practitioner here at the community, and I'll let Ronnie Sue talk a little bit more about that. Yes, um, many of us here have sought counseling or therapy for ourselves or our family members in the past. Some of us here may, this may be a totally new experience, but at some point in our lives, many of us have come to the realization that, gee, I wish I had someone to talk to, not just a spouse or a friend, but a professional who could understand what I'm going through. Why am I feeling this way? How could I feel better? Well, we're really embarking on a new pathway to develop resources. You're gonna hear from Kathy in a minute because Kathy is our first, uh, the first person we have found, and there are gonna be many more, we hope, uh, that can provide that. And there's gonna be three ways in which anyone here will be able to uh, take advantage of Kathy or whoever will, uh, in addition to Kathy. One is, some of you, or some of us, have spoken with Mary Jo, or Angel, or Sarah, or Michelle, or Cameron, or anyone in administration about something that may be bothering us. Do you know of someone that I can talk to? They will be able now to refer you, or your spouse, or your neighbor, to Kathy or whomever for one-on-one -on -one counseling in your apartment billed to Medicare or your other insurance where you will not have to pay a dime. And this will be totally confidential. The other avenue would be maybe a family member, maybe your son or your daughter has said, mom, dad, you know, you really should talk to someone. Ever since mom died, you are just off the wall. So a family member may be able to suggest that. And the third way would be totally on your own, also totally confidential. Kathy's phone number will be available. You can call her without calling Sarah or Angel or anybody on the task force or concierge. You can just make the appointment yourself and Kathy or whomever 
will come to your apartment. This is just a beginning. We hope there will be several more therapists that we will identify for you who have experience in working with our age group, who are completely licensed, knowledgeable. We have met with Kathy. We felt very good about her background and who she is. And at that point, I'm gonna turn this over to Kathy so that she can introduce herself and talk about what she can provide. say that I have to be from the East Coast, but I'm not. Um, I was born in the Midwest with uh, two brothers and a mother, and my father passed away when I was a child. So I went through a lot of things in my life that I believe has brought me to this profession. And uh, with an understanding of how we have to keep going when something really horrible happens. And that happens, you know. So um, I've worked with so many different populations. I don't even know if I could go through all of them, but I started out working with moms and babies. And then I went to um, daycare. And then I went to uh, grade school. And at that time, I started working with people who had, um, I have a particular interest in people growing up with a parent or a sibling that have addiction in their life um, because it's very painful and it's very hard and we all blame ourselves and uh, it's not our fault. So I have a particular understanding of that and I have some um, really concrete tools to help people with that um, because there are, people have taken the time to write books um, and then after that, I started seeing everybody, which I still do now. I have a private practice here in New Falls, um, and it's in my home. And most of all of us are still seeing, uh, uh, talking to therapists on the phone. And I don't have a problem with that. Some people do, but I don't have a problem with that. So uh, I could have a conversation with you a couple of times before meeting with you, just in case you don't want to commit Right away, I will. I have a biller. My biller will bill your insurance, and I don't want a dime. I could take a cookie or two. <laughs> 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 but, um, uh, you know, I, this is something that I've devoted my life to. Um, I married. Uh, my husband's still alive, um, and I have one son who's thirty-five. I, I think sometimes people want to know. You see this person. What is your life like? What you know? I, this is my second career. Um, my first career, I was a jeweler, and uh, I you know, worked in the arts. My father was an artist. My son was an artist. My husband's an artist. I had to get away. <laughs> so, um, but I have a very uh, particular passion and leaning towards the arts and understanding of the struggle of becoming an artist. Yes, sir. What are your professional qualifications? Oh, okay, those are important. So um, I got my master's degree from Hunter College. I think there's a couple other of us here, which at the time I went to school there was the best social work school in the you know, coast. Um, I don't know what it is now. My daughter-in-law just went there. She didn't love it so much, but um, what was I going to say? You asked me. Oh, and then after that, uh, so now I have my bachelor's, I got my master's. And then I went to a training program, a three-year training program where you're supervised on every case uh, by a clinician um, for psychoanalysis. I hesitate to say that because it sounds so pompous, psych psychoanalysis, but um, I am a psychoanalyst. I like to think of uh, the work I do more like sitting on a sofa and talking to somebody. I don't like thinking about 
diagnoses, you know, people come to me all the time, they say, well, am I borderline, am I this, am I that? And I'm like, well, what do you think? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm just not interested in, uh, I can spot some uh, because of my own family experience, but, you know, I, it's not so, I'm not so interested in giving you a diagnosis. I'm more interested in helping and hearing what you think will help. I have a little, blurb on psychology today which you can google and that's pretty much what i how i feel I, it's not what i want it's what you want and how, you know uh, other than winning the lottery i can't really help you with that um i can help you know talk about your relationship with your father your relationship with your mother your children um i have an understanding of that is that enough <laughs> see if anybody has any questions yes yes sir Hold on, right. why don't you take the mic? Uh, Kathy, could you hold the microphone like this? I we're see. Oh, hearing, yeah, good. We're only oh. hearing about, or I'm only hearing oh, about. Oh, I'm so sorry. Word. Thanks. Please don't ask me to repeat what I just <laughs> said. <laughs> so as part of the survey that we are going to put out, we will include a copy of Kathy's uh, resume. Oh, and see this. That's what I was thinking this morning when I left the house. Did you pass that around? Because you should. <laughs> yeah, we will. I wanted to introduce you first. Thank you. Name, you know, a face out, and then we will circulate the, uh, the CV. With, yourselves, you know, I'm not so far from your age, uh, in their 80s and 90s, you know, and everybody needs somebody to talk to, and sometimes it's um, just just to talk to about it out loud to someone else is very helpful. Not necessarily that it gets fixed, but there's an understanding. I just wanted to add, I, I just wanted to add that when you talk about counseling, it doesn't necessarily just mean one-to-one. -one. Sometimes people are counseled as a couple, especially at the time of transition for one of them. Or there's couples therapy and family therapy. It's hard it's to like hear you way, way. Oh, here's the other way. This right way? So I just wanted to say that not knowing who needs what and who will provide the service, just theoretically to remember that, that sometimes like two people would say, a couple and one of us is uh, not feeling well and things come up um, there's no reason the counselor wouldn't talk to the two people together if that's what they want and, and if that's what's needed not just individual what is that? Oh, I also want to say that we've talked about family situations and we know that very often there are conflicts in families, especially when the parent is in a, a, a place like Woodland Bond and the child is reversing roles. Uh, I mean, we there are a lot of issues that we have talked about that we are aware of. We can't solve everything at one time. If you have suggestions, please forward them to Cameron uh, so that we can talk about them and that we can uh, see what the needs are of people um, and hopefully we will make this this is the first time 
And, am I right, Michelle? This is the only program in, in among the CCRCs in New York City. There is no other CCRC that is attempting to establish a mental health program. So we're really thrilled about it, and we hope you will be, and that you will talk to your neighbors. And uh, I mean, it's not a secret. We want people to, we want to normalize the idea of getting help when you uh, have an issue. So please feel free to discuss what you hear today. And I just wanted to emphasize that, Rhea. I mean, one of the things we've talked extensively about at all of our sessions is our desire to normalize the fact that this is all acceptable, it's good, and to Rhea's point, um, there's so much of an impact on your physical health and how you feel and how you're interacting with the world that comes from making sure that emotionally and mentally you're in the best possible place. This also has added benefits to memory and cognition and focus. Because as you can work through issues that are complicating your life and your brain, it allows you to focus more. Brie, did you want to add something? Yeah, like, can I just hang on one second? Let me give you this money. Go ahead, Frida. I would say this is excellent and I appreciate this because it's so important that we can communicate. But my question is, my observation, that men are less willing to communicate how they feel than women. Now, perhaps there should be some kind of groups of men only or groups of women only because from my own experience and observations, men will talk about football and baseball. Women will talk about how they feel about their husbands. <laughs> you are so right. Well, I think that's an age old observation. We, we can try to crack that nut here at Wilma Pond. Lima? Uh, Kathy? Kathy, uh, I just was wondering, uh, since I have a human resource background, how you were recruited and what is it about this particular facility that interests you professionally? They have no idea. They <laughs> called me. So you have to ask them. Go ahead, Tamara. You can go ahead, Tamara. I belong to the Social Work Society up here in the uh, um, Hudson Valley, and I sent out an email on our listserv asking people, and I actually try to remember what I said, but basically, if someone is interested in working with the senior population, and you were one of the few people who responded, and this goes back over a year. And, and I kept the list, and Sarah kept the list, and now the list has been activated, so I am thrilled. I didn't know that's where it came from. It came from. You responded to my email and said, I'm interested. Oh, maybe I did. <laughs> it only works. I'm always interested. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Uh, Pat? My comment is to you. Have you even visited the health center? I think the health center is kind of a thing that a lot of people put off till when they need it. You needn't be afraid. One of your requests should be, I'd like to take you up on the tour of the health center. So you needn't be afraid if down the road, you might need to take up residence in assisted living, or in Garden View, or even skilled nursing. We are a unique place. Take advantage of everything that we have to offer. Following up on Pat's comment, at one of our meetings, we ended up with the phrase, that the health center is the boogeyman in the room. It's scary, it's not fun, but we don't talk about it very much. 
and we also don't talk about our adjustment to coming to independent living, which is absolutely wonderful, but can make some people totally crazy. So these are enormous issues, and they're very sensitive and difficult issues. So when we try to dip our toe into this, I just want to acknowledge how hard it is for everyone. Bill? When we first, when we first came to Woodland Pond three years ago, today, um, that it was easy to go up the elevator and through assisted living, and there are lots of activities in the great room in the health center that we could attend, and COVID has shut all that down. So it would be really good if we could look forward to or have some invitation or figure out a way to have some more interaction with the facility over there without having to wear goggles and masks. And if that's not possible, then maybe we can, I'm not sure we can do, but uh, at least try to anticipate when it might be possible. Yeah. That's a great point. Uh, we are still on COVID restrictions in the health center. Uh, but certainly things like scheduled tours can happen with the proper precautions. Um, we are all chomping at the bit to have those precautions be lifted, um, but we can do certain things within bounds. Um, one other thing that we didn't really touch on, but that all can be encompassed in all of these things, um, because it's a reality here at the community, and again, we're trying to normalize things, so we need to say it like it is, um, there is substance abuse here at the community among residents. Um, some of it is alcohol, some of it is opiates, some of it is cigarettes. Um, and for those that are struggling with substance abuse, either in yourself or with a neighbor, you see a neighbor that's struggling or a spouse, all of that can also be accomplished with any of these support groups, one-on-one -on -one visits from us. And everything that's discussed will be completely confidential. This task force is not going to be knowing who's meeting with who. That's not how this will work. Um, but but that's another reality that you know complicates the aging process as well. Kathy, would you like to add something? Yeah. I don't know if I said this before. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> I don't know if I said this or not, but I worked with a lot of substance abusers and still do. And I'm very familiar with the 12-step program, which is the best program, I think. So that's one thing I wanted to say. And what did you say at the end? Something else. Oh yeah, we are bound. Uh, if we're licensed, we're bound by law. We'll lose our license if we start talking about you. To you know, it's not uh, it's not acceptable at all. So. Just so you know. A topic, that, a topic that I don't think was mentioned was um, aging itself. Pick up the microphone, please, Jim. The prospects of aging and what might accompany it, illness or memory loss. And it's, um, it's very frightening. Yeah. I think our educational seminars, we've talked at length about that, Barbara. I think the best and earliest opportunity for us to start to address those issues starts with the educational topics. So when we put the surveys out, we will give you some ideas of some of the topics we might introduce in education. Um, but if you have ideas yourself, you know that's a great point. Um, the concept of aging will flow through all of these things necessarily here at the senior living community. Um, but we're really hopeful that we can schedule between two and four per year uh, high level educational information sessions with very high level practitioners, experts in the field. Um, and you, didn't you say that you attended a, a seminar on aging here um, or death? Yeah, here's, here's the mic. It was death, wasn't it, or yeah. something? Yeah. Five years ago, we had a woman come to Woodland Pond from the city who has a background on death. 
Well, she came with her, any, remember being here? It was too long, number one. It almost took two hours to get through her slides. And what she did was she took us through the possible feelings of dying from rapid to long-term suffering to just knowing your time is limited and how to deal with it. As I said, we found out she had a great reputation. She came with her slides, but we know when we schedule these things, we're gonna do one hour. Otherwise, we fall asleep. It's our nap time. <laughs> One of the things that we're doing is looking for resources, not just uh, resources like Kathy, but resources in the community or beyond the community that can come here and do educational workshops or do a group. We're looking for experts, people who have studied older people, people who can come and talk about death and dying and aging. Um, we're all there. Uh, it's something that as a community we do not talk about. It's the bugaboo. Um, and we talk about over there because those people in the health center, well, they're the ones that are sick. They're the ones that are dying. And the rest of us, we're going to live forever. Except we know that that's not true. So in terms of normalizing mental health, we want to normalize what life is like and what's happening to all of us. And aging is one of those things that we don't like to admit, but none of us is as good as we were 10 years ago or even before that. We just had people come from, um, I forget exactly what they call themselves, but the deaf cast thing. Death cafes. I don't want you to ignore that because we just did have that. I think we could have more of those too. Just and beginning to talk about these subjects is very important. too much attention. Um, well, cancel that. Um, what I haven't heard much of today from you is what I see the most often around here. Um, and it's people who are losing their spouses and one way or another the spouses keep dying um, or they go um, to the health center or they develop Alzheimer's, you name it. Uh, something's happening with the spouses. Um, and, and, and to me, that kind of loss is what I've seen most. I wasn't even aware there was an addiction problem around here. Well, I know of one smoker, and one person couldn't surprise me with drinking. But basically, you know, I didn't realize this could even be a problem at Little Pond. Um, but I, I think the pain of loss is tremendous here being ignored. Sometimes the new residents are coming out of that. They just lost their spouse. <coughs> A um, simple question, what is the difference between a social worker and a psychologist and any other professions that may be, we may be referred to? Do they deal with different problems? No. Are they trained differently? They're trained, they are trained uh, for Maria? You have a Maria. Maria. Oh, Wayne, Wayne. Wayne, you have the highest degree. <laughs> <laughs> What? <laughs> is it working this time? Yes. Yeah. Um, if somebody is going to be doing a, doing psychotherapy, 
It could be a pastoral counselor. It could be a nurse. Um, there are psychiatric nurses. There are social workers. That's the, the largest group of uh, people who do psychotherapy counseling. Um, psychologists, clinical psychologists, uh, as opposed to other kinds of psychologists like corporate and industrial psychologists and, or child psychologists. The psychologists have to have a PhD and a certain number of years before they're certified. Social workers also, before they're reimbursable, have to have seven years of clinical experience. Um, and then there's psychiatrists, and it used to be that the psychiatrists who had MDs and then did residences, residencies in psychiatry would do psychotherapy, most often psychoanalysis. That's almost not the case at all anywhere in America because they're writing prescriptions for um, sleep medicine, anxiety medicine, etc., etc. Um, so psychopharmacology is pretty much what the psychiatry, the psychiatrists do. Um, but most generally, it's psychologists and social workers. And counselors. And, and various other kind of counselors. And counselors. And counselors. Oh, yeah, it's a new profession. The guy, the counselors, mental, mental health counselors. Um, back in the day, I didn't know about this. Just in recent years, that there are people who have a master's in that. Often, those are people who have done, had worked with uh, in the field of addiction, and and then they they were working with individuals and their families, and so they end up doing lots of supportive work and family work and. Now that's generalized to counseling in general. So I actually have to excuse myself because we have a safety committee meeting at two. Uh, Cameron, you have to come to that also. So we will leave you to complete your discussion. Um, I'm very thankful to all of you at this table. Uh, I think that this has been a lot of work accomplished very quickly, and I look forward to continuing to work with you on this. So go ahead and finish, you know, continue your conversation. I just want to thank Michelle and Cameron before they leave. They've been unbelievable. <laughs> and I want to make two brief points. Um, Wayne mentioned psychiatrists and medication. Uh, in the Hudson Valley, there are very few psychiatrists. There's very little psychiatric medication. Most of it is given out through your um, PCP, your personal you have a family practitioner. Um, there are nurse practitioners who are specializing in psychiatry and have medication privileges. We are getting together a list of medical people. If someone feels they want to be evaluated for medication, you know, therapy is wonderful. I'm the first one to say it, but there's a place for medication if people are interested. We are in the midst of getting a list of psychiatrists, psychopharmacologists, and psychiatric nurse practitioners. So that's one more thing that will be available. The other, one more point, I think this group meeting has been very helpful and given us ideas that I haven't thought about, certainly. And I would like to see more meetings and more, and suggestions. If you want to write a note to the mental health task force, uh, please do. I never thought of having someone from assisted living speak to us. I think it's a great idea. So please don't hesitate to communicate. Others with questions? Yeah, I, I just want to add one thing to this, to this topic. Um, if you decide you want to talk with a therapist, whether it's Kathy or you you have someone on the outside, your son says, oh, I know this great therapist. Today, people interview therapists. You can make an appointment with someone and say, look, I'm having trouble with dealing with getting old or whatever. How can you help me? Just like you're a medical consumer, you go to a doctor, I want to check out this doctor to see if he or she is good for me. Please, you have the right to do it. I just wanted to say one other thing. 
about Kathy, who I don't know very well, but when she walked in the door to our meeting, before she even opened her mouth, of course we had seen her resume, there was one thing that I said, wow, this is terrific. She's our contemporary. I don't know that if I had an issue of loss, that I would want to talk to a 25-year-old who just graduated from, uh, who just got their psychology degree. You know, this, this woman has life experience, and I think when you interview a therapist, you make that assessment too. So I just wanted to. Thank you. What, one thing that, that Wayne mentioned that I hadn't heard a lot was the word pastoral. And most of today's priests, rabbis, and pastors are very well trained in counseling. And I, I'm surprised that there isn't a resident chaplain here. My other thing is a comment. As a Christian, we're all talking about the afterlife, but we're all afraid to die. I did not, when I introduced myself, include the fact that I have done pastoral care. As it was pointed out, psychotherapist, I am not licensed in any way doing pastoral care. Pastoral care comes because I was ordained in the Presbyterian Church as a deacon and a deacon with experience in the church. I was asked to work alongside our minister when the minister wasn't available and someone from the church needed attention. I went there with ears. That's a great deal of what pastoral care is. Listen. I have a very loud voice for the years of teaching. I'm sure you can all hear me. Uh, we have people with tremendous experience here. Uh, there is someone in this room right now who has worked as a volunteer in hospice that can tell us an awful lot about death and dying. Uh, we have other people with other kinds of experiences. What I mean is we will not make this a success unless we have your support. And you have to go out there and talk to people because we know that this is a bugaboo to people. Oh my God, I don't need help. It's not just men, and you're right about what you said, Frida. It's not just men, it's women also who don't want to admit that they're weak, that they need somebody, that maybe, maybe my thoughts are not correct. Maybe I need somebody to help me straighten myself out. And we need your support because Kathy can't do this alone. None of us can do this alone. We need to go out to the community and tell people this is a great this is a great opportunity. This is a great thing that we are in this position right now. And I can tell you, after eight years of fighting for some kind of mental health program here, that we finally have one. It's really amazing, and I give Michelle tremendous credit for coming around to this perspective right now. Are there other questions? Anyone? You know, um, hold on a second. Pat, will have you said our return, please? I, I get it about talking, you know, about death and all. But yeah, I can't hear any longer. Can you just remind me? Yeah. You know, like talking about death and all. But I think most of us have experienced it. When you talk to people that have gone through suffering and death, I think it helps immensely. The average person, I mean, I'm not knocking 40 degrees, but I mean, like most of us, you've experienced it and faced it and, and gone there every day to a nursing home. It helps to talk to those people. Oh, absolutely. Anyone else? Comments, questions? Okay. I just want to say thank you. I think all of this matters intensely. And it's hard to begin the conversation. Thank you for, for being us.